This is Naked Mormonism. I pledge my life, all that I may have. I will strive to the utmost of my ability to be what you would want me to be. It's time to find the truth. And having set our hand to the plow, we will never look back until this work is finished. Where is the church going? I have faith that the Constitution will be saved as prophesied by Joseph Smith. But it will not be saved in Washington. It will be saved by enlightened members of this church. The explicit tag is there for a reason. So if you get offended at what's said, it's not for you. But most importantly, may you ponder the truths you've heard. May they help you become even better than you were. Skepticize everything. Welcome to episode 38 of the Naked Mormonism podcast, the Serial Mormon History Podcast. Today is Thursday, September 8th, 2016. My name is Bryce Plankenagle, and thank you for joining me. After more than a month break from the historical timeline, we are well overdue for advancing through 1837 in our narrative. Let's briefly review what happened last timeline episode for, you know, a bit of milk to wet our palate, after which we'll dive right into the meat of today's episode. If we recall back to the last historical timeline episode, the Kirtland Safety Society Anti-Banking Company had been incorporated and began printing its own money in early 1837. Last episode began with Joe and Hinchpin Rigdon dissolving the Oliver Cowdery and Company printing press to be absorbed into the Kirtland Safety Society Company. And this really expressed to us just how much power was being wielded upon the establishment of this company, and nobody was around that could rein it in or check the power balance. After that, we talked a little bit about the political atmosphere that was surrounding the mid-1830s. After Andrew Jackson's hotly controversial presidency, the Whig Party devised some interesting plans to get a Whig president elected, which failed, as opposed to another Democrat like Jackson was. You know, people back then were just as adamantly opinionated about politics as we are today. I mean, the parties simply had different labels and fought for or against important topics of that time. The Mormons living in Missouri were in a somewhat hostile situation, not only because of their inherent abolitionist leanings, but also because of the political turmoil between them and the already established citizens of Missouri. We ended the last historical timeline episode with a discussion about Joe evading a possible coup d'etat. By mid-1837, a lot of the church leadership didn't like the direction in which the church was heading. So, from first appearances, it looks like they tried to take over by any means necessary. You know, killing Joe in this case. Joe survived this coup, but he won't survive another coup attempt that happens seven years from this point in our timeline. Alright, that did it for the meat of the last historical timeline episode and fills us with the milk of today's episode. So let's jump into the meat for today. Currently, our timeline sits at the end of May 1837, but something important did happen on Andrew Jackson's way out of the office in March of 37. He essentially caused the greatest economic depression seen in the entire history of the United States up to that point. Now, when we talk about the Kirtland Safety Society Company, Joe and Rigdon weren't the only people in America that were founding bullshit companies to print proprietary money. It was actually happening constantly. Hundreds of companies were operating just like the Kirtland Safety Society Company and had been operating that way for decades before it came along. Now, there are always myriad factors that contribute to an economic depression. That's just inherent in what an economic depression is. Jackson wasn't the most popular president in many ways. He was the president that signed into law the Indian Removal Act of 1830. I mean, th this point in American history directly overlays our historical timeline in the mid-1830s. The Indian Removal Act made it not only legal, but presidentially mandated to remove the natives from their homelands and relocate them to states west of the Mississippi. A lot of these removals came after 1838 when Martin Van Buren, who was another Democrat, had assumed office, but treaties were in the works throughout all of 1830 to remove the natives peaceably. Um, and of course, that didn't always work. Headlines were circulating all over the place 
about battles that were breaking out between the native and the American troops during the removal of the Seminoles from Florida and, you know, other tribes from other places. It really was an ugly time for the office of president. You know, if you were one of the people that sympathized with the natives or, you know, wanted nonviolent cultural assimilation, it was easy to dislike the Democrats. Beyond that, Jackson refused to renew the charter of the Second Bank of the U.S. in 1832, which led to a four-year redistribution of wealth to the largest private banks, which were colloquially referred to as pet banks. In March of 1837, right before leaving his office to Van Buren, Jackson signed something called the Specie Circular, which made it so any land that was being expanded westward would have to be purchased from the government in hard gold or silver. This made it so hundreds of banks or companies just like the Kirtland Safety Society Company that were buying and lending with paper money in the constantly expanding and newly appropriated western frontier lose everything. The paper they were running their business around became essentially valueless because the government would no longer accept it as money. Like at any time in economics, when a currency dips, it creates panic. When a currency becomes worthless, it creates pandemonium. Not only that, but the cash reserves of the Bank of England were dangerously low because they had had a couple of years of bad wheat harvest, among other factors. So that means the world's largest economy, the United Kingdom, was running a deficit and reducing its spending to match that deficit. The Bank of England was lending with tighter restrictions and higher interest rates, so their economy was in a decline, slowing the economy of the entire modernized world. From February of 1837 to March of the same year, one month, cotton prices in the United States fell 25%. By one quarter of the price. That is indicative of just how impactful this depression was and how lightning quick it affected the commodities market and the world economy as a whole. Keep in mind, the church had established this Kirtland Safety Society company to issue notes to anybody that would use them as currency and was purchasing land in Missouri on credit with their own currency that they were printing. Just to reiterate, the Mormon Bank wasn't the only company that was doing this. During the seven-year depression from 1837 to, uh, you know, like 1843, 44, 45, of the 850 banks that were in service across the United States, 343 closed permanently and 62 partially failed. That's almost half of the banks that were in service across the United States that collapsed during the the Panic of 1837. And that says nothing about the companies that were founded to masquerade as banks like the the Kirtland Safety Society Company was. I mean, this was also nearly a 100 years before the FDIC insurance was formed in during the Great Depression in the 1930s. If you had money in any of those banks that failed at this time, Instantly, all of your money was just gone. I mean, overnight, millions of people with nothing more than proprietary notes from banks or company like the Kirtland Safety Society company notes lost everything they had. All of their money became worthless. It was a bubble that had been inflating for decades and the pop nearly crumbled society. Just like every other depression, I guess. I, I, some estimate this highest unemployment to be between 25 and 30 percent in some places. Uh, that's kind of a hard number to verify given the nature of the information. But anywhere from a quarter to a third of people in some places may have been out of a job. Now, th- that's crazy. That is really tough to deal with. And hopefully we can understand from the economic and political atmosphere of the time that Current events were stressful for a lot of farmers or anybody that made a living off of speculation, whether that speculation was land or otherwise. Everybody was affected by this panic of 1837. At this time, you know, this is, this is around early to mid 1837, right? The church was teetering on a knife edge with their gratuitous level of accrued debt and shady business practices that were fucking over investors left and right. And most of those fucked over investors were members in the church at the highest leadership levels. Essentially, these people were putting 100% of their faith and their life savings in the hands of a 31 year old prophet. With this massive economic collapse, is it any wonder why so many people wanted to remove Joe from the role of prophet? 
People that were working as his underlings and close advisors, whether that removal meant by, you know, usurpation or outright homicide, (laughs) who knows? But the drama of church leadership really begins to come into focus here, doesn't it? When we understand the social and political pressures driving Joe and his friends to do what they did, suddenly they seem to come into focus as human beings. Hopefully, everybody listening can remember back to the 2008 economic collapse and the uh, the subsequent recession in the following years. Some called it a depression that we're still recovering from now. I mean, do you remember the feeling of desperation when people's retirements and assets were just evaporating into thin air? And when people were going crazy upside down in their mortgages and in their uh, car loans and all that? I mean... Remember how powerless we all felt and how badly we wanted answers or for somebody to go to jail? At least that's how I experienced it. The people that were living in 1837 were feeling the same thing towards the companies that had lost all their money. It just turns out that the people we're discussing right now had invested into the church and the church's proprietary company, and they could only blame the leadership for making poor monetary decisions with the company. Which brings up some tough questions. I mean, how could somebody that's a prophet engage in some activities? Uh, I mean, how could somebody that has a pipeline to God not know about this? You know, how could God not warn his prophet that the economy was going to collapse and that founding the Kirtland Safety Society company was a really bad idea, especially at this time in, in history? I'm going to read a chunk from Wilford Woodruff's journal. Now, he chronicled things religiously, and he was a faithful member until he became prophet in 1889 in Salt Lake City, and then subsequently died in 1898. This is from his journal beginning in early 1837. There's going to be a link for it in the show notes to his entire journal, and that's uh, hosted on Risto.us. This is the entry for January 6th, 1837 from Wilford Woodruff's own personal journal. Quote, I visited the office of the Kirtland Safety Society and saw the first money that was issued by the treasurer of the society. This was opening day of the Kirtland Safety Society. It was given to Brother Bump, that was Jacob Bump, in exchange for other notes, who was the first to circulate it. I also heard President Joseph Smith Jr. declare in the presence of F. Williams, that's Freddie G. Willie, D. Whitmer, David Whitmer, S. Smith, Sylvester Smith, W. Parrish, Warren Parrish, and others in the deposit office that he had received that morning the word of the Lord upon the subject of the Kirtland Safety Society. Oh, Joseph had a convenient revelation. Imagine that. He was alone in a room by himself, and he had not only the voice of the Spirit upon the subject, but even in an audible voice. He did not tell us at that time what the Lord said upon the subject, but remarked that if we would give heed to the commandments the Lord had given this morning, all would be well. May the Lord bless Brother Joseph with all the saints and support the above-named institution and protect it so that every weapon formed against it may be broken and come to naught, while the Kirtland Safety Society shall become the greatest of all institutions on earth. End quote. This shows a level of faith that many saints had towards the church and the Kirtland Safety Society company. Wilford Woodruff was obviously a faithful member of the church, and we can see him being suckered into thinking the company was on the up and up. And it kind of seems like people were a bit blindly optimistic at this time. Woodruff wasn't the only guy. The majority of the members that were in the church bought into this and thought that the Kirtland Safety Society company was a good idea. His next entry is from January 7th, 18th, 1837. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read quite a few entries leading all the way up to April, uh, and each of them enlighten us to the time as it's progressing, because they were chronicled at the exact time. I mean, these weren't written after. They, he, you know, Woodruff wasn't looking back and writing these at times that he had remembered. No, he was writing these day to day as these this time frame was progressing. So the entry from January 17th, 1837 says, quote, met at candlelight with the Quorum of the Seventies, and was favored with a lecture from President David Whitmer. He warned us to humble ourselves before God, lest his hand rest upon us in anger for our pride and many sins that we are running into in our days of prosperity as the ancient Nephites did. It does now appear evident that a scourge awaits this stake of Zion, even Kirtland, If there is not great repentance, immediate, and almost every countenance indicates the above expectation, especially the heads of the church. 
May the Lord in mercy enable us to meet every event with resignation, end quote. So maybe the previous entry from, you know, January 6th, 10 whole days before this, was a bit optimistic. It went from the, quote, Kirtland Safety Society Company will be the greatest of all institutions on earth to, quote, it does now appear evident that a scourge awaits this stake of Zion. I mean, the company had only been formed essentially a week and a half before this entry, and already things were looking a little scary. Remember, this was during a time when the world economy was in the middle of the greatest crash it had seen in many decades. The average person was beginning to feel a pinch in their pocketbooks, and the Kirtland Safety Society company wasn't much salvation as it was wallowing in substantial debt by itself. The next entry is from January 31st, 1837. It says, quote, Met in the house of the Lord at 10 o'clock a.m. and heard an address from Presidents J. Joseph Smith and S. Sidney Rigdon on the temporal business of the church and petitioned for a charter to the Assembly of the State for the Kirtland Safety Society. The presidency of the church bought the Monroe Charter, and we all lent a hand in establishing it that it might be beneficial to us in forwarding the building of the temporal kingdom, end quote. Now, here we have the slow evolution of the leadership focusing on more temporal things. Temporal things, that's a code word for money problems. The leadership knew that the company was merely a band-aid to the hemorrhaging that was happening with the church debts that were substantial enough to cripple it, in the near future anyway. So the meetings tended to be more accurately reflecting of their pressing concerns, church debt, of course. The next entry is from February 19th, 1837, quote, I repaired to the house of the Lord and stood in the midst of the congregation of the saints where I beheld President Joseph Smith Jr. arise in the stand and for several hours addressed the saints in the power of God. Joseph had been absent from Kirtland on business for the church, though not half as long as Moses was in the mount. Many were stirred up in their hearts, and some were against him as the Israelites were against Moses. But when he arose in the power of God in their midst, as Moses did anciently, they were put to silence, for the complainers saw that he stood in the power of a prophet. Oh, how weak is man. End quote. Here, you know, in my opinion anyway, Joe was showing his cards a little bit. We see Joe's focus shifting towards temporal issues more and more as Woodruff's timeline progresses through early 1837. No longer were Joe and Rigdon standing up in front of the congregation telling them that the Lord has great riches in store for them in Zion. Now, you know, now it's all about obedience and the fact that only the best members of the church are those who don't complain or question the leadership. We can't say that things were beginning to collapse yet. A collapse, the word collapse as we see it, is a single point on a timeline, not a slow degradation leading up to the collapse. Unfortunately, that word is, you know, the word collapse is insufficient to describe what was happening. You know, I like that old adage, pride goeth before the fall. It's a theme that appears multiple times throughout the Book of Mormon. And, you know, it's, if anything, the central theme of the Book of Mormon. And it's something that was imprinted into my early childhood. Well, the words pride and fall may seem like single points in a timeline, but that's simply not how reality works. Now, you know, a crescendo or a climax will happen in music or in movies, and the fall can usually be turned as one point in time. But when we talk about reality, these phenomena occur at a much slower and drawn out rate. When we apply this pride before the fall philosophy to the current safety society company, when the company was founded and people were buying and selling things with these proprietary banknotes in January and February of 1837, people were happy. The leadership was prideful and optimistic about the situation. What could possibly go wrong? The next entry is from March 23rd, 1837. Quote, At the meeting in the Kirtland Temple, the power of God rested upon the people and the gifts were poured out upon us. Some had the administering of angels and the image of God sat upon the countenances of the saints. At 4 o'clock p.m., 
The veils were rolled up together, which brought the whole congregation in full view of each other. And while the presence of the Lord filled the house, the congregation of the saints fell upon their knees, and all as one man vocally poured forth rejoicing, supplications, and prayer before the God of Israel, which closed the services of the day after contributing to the support of the poor." End quote. The way I see it is this party was a death knell. The leadership was essentially having a celebration of the one-year anniversary of the Kirtland Temple being dedicated and, you know, culminating the success of the church at some level. They had another party with the use of anointing oil, and then it describes here, and the veils were rolled up so the whole congregation could see each other, the people fell to their knees, some people saw angels, others saw God in the room, just like they had one year previous to this. I mean, if you look at it through my lenses, this just sounds like it was another good old hallucinogen party. But, you know, that's only if you buy into that theory. But remember back to the beginning of the meat of this episode? This was going on all while people were ignorant to the fact that Andrew Jackson had just fucked them over so hard. At this entry, March 23rd, he had signed the Specie Circular, which, you know, devalued the paper money that people were using, but the people in Kirtland weren't aware of this quite yet. It's, it's just like, like an old cartoon or something, you know. The people in the church, especially the leadership, it's like they were running towards a cliff at full steam, you know, with their own paper money being the solution to everything. And then they just hadn't realized that the cliff had ended 10 steps ago and they were just running out into thin air. You know, all, all it took is for them to just look down and see that there's nothing supporting them for everything to collapse. And, you know, of course, that's where we run into the problem with the word collapse again. It's like it's pointing to a single point in time. You know, the, the structure of the church didn't collapse like a demolitions crew collapses a skyscraper in a matter of seconds. It was a much more sluggish catastrophe, like, like watching a slow motion video of a train wreck. We know what's going to happen. It's only a matter of time before we get to watch it play out in front of us in real time. Now, finally, the next entry in Woodruff's journal has a heightened level of urgency and desperation. This is how I'm perceiving it anyway. Word was finally circulating that Jackson had signed into law the Specie Circular, which forced any person, institution, or entity to purchase Western lands with hard resources, namely gold or silver. No longer would the government accept paper notes for expansion into the western frontier, which was the land the government was constantly taking from the Native Americans with their relocation treaties. It doesn't say that all the money taken in by the government would have to be gold or silver, just money taken as payment for land west of the Mississippi. The paper money the church was using to buy and sell property in Missouri was deemed basically worthless at this point, as was any other paper money that was being printed by any other private banking company. You know, th th those were all over the place in America, and this basically popped the economic bubble that had been inflating for decades before this. Now, the next entry in Woodruff's journal indicates a shift in Joe's attitude, and this is the desperation that I'm talking about. I'm going to read it, and you tell me if you feel the same shift that I'm perceiving. The next entry is April 6th, 1836, seven years to the day after the foundation of the Church of Christ. Quote, At a meeting following the administration of the anointings, anointing oil, Joseph desired us to give heed to his words and teachings this once, and be wise that Zion and her stakes may speedily be redeemed. He instructed us to be sure that those that enter the kingdom to spend up their wise men to Kirtland with their money to counsel with presidency and purchase an inheritance before they move their families or bring the poor to the places of gathering for to suffer. Basically, what Joseph is saying there is uh, when you're telling people about Zion and they want to move here, make sure you get a down payment for them to move. Don't just let them move out here without any possessions or money. And it goes on to say, also that we must keep in view the institution of the Kirtland Safety Society. And if the elders of Israel would be faithful and do what was in their power this once, Kirtland should speedily be redeemed and become a stronghold not to be thrown down. 
Joseph presented us in some degree the plot of the city of Kirtland, which is a stronghold of the daughter of Zion. So here Joe was uh, up on the stand saying, this is how awesome Kirtland will be if you just follow my destructions. As it was given him by vision, it was great, marvelous, and glorious. The city extended to the east, west, north, and south. Steamboats will come puffing into the city. Our goods will be conveyed upon railroads from Kirtland to many places and probably to Zion. Houses of worship would be reared unto the Most High. Beautiful streets were to be made for the saints to walk in. Kings of the earth would come to behold the glory thereof. And many glorious things not now to be named would be stowed upon the saints." But all these things are better imagined than spoken by the children of Jacob. End quote. Did that seem desperate at all? Joe was up on the stand showing everybody plans that he'd drawn out for Kurland and how great it'll be. Supposedly revealed to him by the power of God. But the people just had to have faith this once in the Kirtland Safety Society Company and then, you know, bring more people to the church or, you know, just the people's money. We don't actually need the people to even come. We just need their money. I mean, he was selling it hard, right? Boats will be shipping our goods. The streets will be made beautiful for the saints to walk in. Goods will be conveyed on Railroads, churches will be built everywhere. Kings will come from miles across the globe to come look at our town and see how awesome it is. A little over-promising, if you ask me. Especially at a time when the general economy was amidst a major crash. What does one build the perfect city with when one can't afford anything with which to build it? Hopes and dreams? I mean, were these meeting houses and railroads going to be made from the good faith and the earnest hopes of the Mormons? I mean, new construction usually comes to a screeching halt when an economy declines. How were they going to fund all this new building and expansion in Kirtland? Uh, keeping with this cartoon illustration, it's like Joe and friends had finally looked down after running off the edge of the cliff, only to see thin air under their feet. I mean, what we're seeing here, in my opinion, is like Joe's obligatory, you know, look down, oh, look up, and then he looks down and then looks back up at the camera with a look of desperation in his face right before he plummets to certain death with a little poof when he lands, right? The church was sinking, along with so many other businesses in 1837. Which leads me to a point that I've made a, a few times in the past, but it seems plenty relevant right now. All history is deeply intertwined. There's no way of separating off a single event in, in history, whether it's Mormon history, American history, or world history. It doesn't matter. There's no way of singling it out and talking about it in isolation apart from the world that it existed in. And that's what makes constructing a narrative like this so hard to do in a complete way. There are endless competing factors that contribute to the reality of history. You know, it gets challenging trying to figure out what to give more time to and what historical tides contributed enough influence to merit any mention or examination in this show. That's why we started this episode talking about Andrew Jackson's last, like, fuck you as he left office. That's the species circular that popped the bubble and incited the panic of 1837 and the subsequent depression after that. Once the species circular was passed, as I said earlier, cotton prices dropped 25% in one month. That's an enormous collapse. What does this have to do with the Mormon historical timeline? Now, why are cotton prices specifically significant to American history in the late 1830s? Yeah. More so than the, the environmental and economic factors that were contributing to the timeline and to the, the tides and forces of history at the time, specifically, there's a more important effect here. Most paper back then was made from cotton pulp. Wood pulp paper that we use today wouldn't be popular for another decade or two. You know, it started becoming regular in about 1850, 1860. Many people throughout the earliest time in settled America, many of which were young children, made a living as rag pickers or someone who digs through garbage dumps to find old rags to sell for pounding into pulp, pulp that would later be refined into paper, cotton pulp. With the lost jobs and general decline of the economy starting at the end of 1836 and really becoming a problem in 1837, cotton prices dropped and paper prices drastically inflated. 
making it too expensive for many people to keep a personal journal who had been keeping one before. Unfortunately, a couple of my favorite first-hand Mormon sources go completely dark at this point in history, which is made even more frustrating by the fact that this was at a time when insurrection and excommunications were cresting unprecedented levels in the church. The book from which I'm pulling Woodruff's history has a blackout period from April 1837 to April of 1839, a two-year bout of silence when the panic of 1837 and depression of it were at their lowest, most hard-hitting point. Now, I don't know if this is because Woodruff didn't keep as many entries during this time because of the increased cost of paper, or if there are entries that exist from 1838 that just weren't included in this source. Either way, the next line we read from Woodruff's journal is from April of 1839, two years later, talking about laying the cornerstone for a temple in far west Missouri. An entry half a year after the Battle of Crooked River and the Missouri-Mormon War had essentially come to an end. Now, I found a couple of entries from Woodruff during this time, but I can't seem to find the level of consistency that was present in his journal before April of 1837, which was nearly daily entries. So to put this into context and, you know, talk about all of these things culminating and creating this succession crisis we're about to talk about, the last historical timeline episode included a discussion about a court that was being held to determine if some of the members of the Missouri church were acting against the will of the prophet. That happened on May 28th, 1837, a month after what we just read from Woodruff's journal, whose last entry was from April of 1837. To refresh our collective memory, it was recorded that multiple people were being tried for unrighteous conduct, and the people that were charged questioned by what authority Hinchpin Rigdon and Ollie Cowdung were judging them. It was concluded that nobody had the proper authority to convict somebody of a church crime, and the meeting, quote, dispersed in confusion, end quote. And that's pretty much where we ended the last historical timeline episode. Turns out, that trial was just the beginning of the troubles. I mean, this this court tribunal, trial, tribunal, whatever you want to call it, in late May of 1837 signals the most tumultuous period in Mormon history up to this point. One day after the court dismissed in confusion, a complaint was filed against Joseph Smith by two apostles, Orson Brainpower Pratt, who was uh, P. Cubed, Parley P. Pratt's brother, and Leadfoot Lyman Johnson, whose sister would be one of Joe's wives very soon. Now, this is found in the High Council minutes for the date listed below, uh, but I'm reading this from H. Michael Marquardt's The Rise of Mormonism, page 447. If I'm not mistaken, this is also included in the History of the Church, volume 2, uh, near the end of the book, but I, I didn't look for it there. Quote, To the bishop and his council in Kirtland, the stake of Zion, we prefer the following charges against President Joseph Smith Jr. vis-a-vis for lying and misrepresentation, also for extortion, and for speaking disrespectfully against his brethren behind their backs. Kirtland, May 29th, 1837. Signed, Lyman E. Johnson and Orson Pratt. End quote. I'll continue reading on the same page from The Rise of Mormonism because it illustrates just how uncertain people were and how close the church was to experiencing a legitimate uprising within its own ranks. Quote, Warren Parrish also preferred charges the same day against Sidney Rigdon, quote, for expressing an unbelief in the revelations of God, both old and new, also for an unbelief in the agency of man and his accountability to God, or that there is such a principle existing as sin, and also for lying and declaring that God required it at his hands. In addition, another apostle, Luke S. Johnson, preferred charges against Joseph Smith Sr., that's Big Daddy Cheese in our timeline, quote, for closing the doors of the house of the Lord against the council, end quote. So that's giving us an idea of how many people were filing legitimate complaints against the leadership of the church. But the following week after all of this disagreement and dissent, another apostle, Parley P. Pratt, that's P. Cubed, Orson Brain Power Pratt's brother, also dissented, but he did so in a much more epic and public fashion than just filing a complaint like these other people did. P. Cubed actually held his own 
meeting where he gave a monstrous sermon. Monstrous in every form of the word. P. Cubed was standing at the pulpit for two hours, railing against the church, saying that it had departed from God and that Brother Joseph Smith had committed great sins. A large number of the people sitting in that congregation reportedly left, weeping for having been deceived by Joe after Pratt finished with his sermon. If one can point to a single time in Joe's life and call it collapse, this would be that point. I've mentioned this a few times since I started this show, stating just how excited I am to arrive here on our timeline, because we're fast approaching this defection crisis that nearly ripped this adolescent church to shreds. This is the defection that D-Day David Whitmer is named after, this defection day. I mean, these these are hard questions, right? What would cause men who supposedly saw the gold plates for themselves to leave Joseph Smith's side? What would make the man who funded the Book of Mormon, not so smarty Marty Harris, turn his back on Joe forever and join the Quakers? What would cause a significant number of church leaders to want to kill Joe, forcing him to flee to far west Missouri and turn his back on Kirtland, Ohio forever? I mean, those are tough questions. And we're probably going to spend the next two or three episodes on this defection crisis. Hopefully, we'll be able to answer some of those questions. I mean, there really are too many different stories to follow that all converge on this one point in Mormon history. Everybody in the church was affected by this defection. Every single member of the church had some hard decisions to make as 1837 wrapped up and 1838 dawned on the horizon. I'm going to do my best to recount everything that happened, but just know that if we were to spend 10 episodes on just 1837 and the beginning of 1838, we still wouldn't get through all of the writing that exists about this very small snapshot of time in American history. Now, I'm not sure how to properly like lead into talking about this whole defection crisis. We've talked about the dissent that was going on all throughout the church. I mean, it's been the focus of most of our episodes up to this point. We we also have talked about how many apostles were preaching blasphemy or just leaving the church altogether at this point. But the people that were leaving in 1837 and 38 specifically meant business this time. They weren't just fucking around. They weren't coming up with their own revelations and saying, I feel like I'm a prophet today. These people actually were defecting. This, this was the schismatic crisis in the church. Brothers Luke and Lyman Johnson, Leadfoot Lyman Johnson, were some of the primary dissenters. Uh, Leadfoot Lyman was a person who filed that formal complaint against Joe on May 29th. Uh, a man named John F. Boynton, who we've talked about before, was also involved with these, these descents. Um, you know, all three of these men were members of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles. You know, on September 4th, 1837, that's jumping ahead a little bit, but on September 4th, 1837, a church conference was held. For anybody unaware, at church conferences, they'll often sustain members of the church, calling for a vote among the congregation for people that agree to sustain them in their calling. It's basically like uh, calling for a vote to do as everybody support this person being in the position that they're in. During this September 4th congregation, both Johnson brothers Luke and Lyman, as well as John F. Boynton, were not sustained as apostles. This marks a prominent fracture in the church leadership. Joe considered these three people to be in opposition to the church, and therefore they weren't sustained as leaders. But it gets so much worse than that, because at the same time, Joe considered Ollie Cowdery, D-Day David Whitmer, John Goebbels Whitmer, and William Wines Phelps, who we know as Double Dub Phelps, to be in transgression. Imagine that today. It would be like Thomas S. Monson getting on the stand at General Conference and saying that Dallin Oaks, Robert Hales, and Jeffrey Holland are n all not sustained because of their recent sins against the church. And also Russell Nelson, Dieter Uchtdorf, Henry Eyring, and M. Russell Ballard are all transgressing and therefore in opposition to the leadership of the church. That would just 
blow people's minds today. That just wouldn't happen. Simple as that. The church would never show disunity in a public setting like Joe did at this time in 1837. I mean, think about this. D-Day David Whitmer, Ollie Kaudong, and John Goebbels Whitmer, two of the three witnesses and one of the eight witnesses of the plates, all faithful members of the church and prominent leaders since the organization of the church in 1830, apostles since the organization of the quorum in 1835, people that had witnessed and scribed for Joseph while he was translating the Book of Mormon were all considered anathema to the church. All of them were in need of a proper ass whooping to straighten them out, which Joe would very soon deliver. Now, whether or not it straightened them out or not, we'll get to that hopefully in the next couple of episodes. But by September, the Kirtland Safety Society Company had utterly failed. In fact, Joe had backed out of it in July, dissolving all of his assets. You know, it's almost like Joe knew that it was a fraud and that things were going to collapse. I mean, I would make the argument that Joe could see the writing on the wall. Now, remember, Joe was just the official cashier for the company, while Rigdon was the actual president of it. So Joe had some level of deniability for involvement at some kind of level, right? But that's only if you completely ignore the fact that it was founded by Joe and Rigdon in the first place. In June of 1837, Joe transferred all of his Kirtland Safety Society company holdings to two men named Oliver Granger and Jay Carter and then resigned from his position as cashier the following month. That's what gives apologist Paul Ausable deniability when they say Joe was in line the whole time, you know, he was he was following the mandates of God because he got out of the Kirtland Safety Society Company before it actually collapsed. That's not true. Joe just knew what was happening and knew what was going to happen after that, and he decided to get out of the game while he was still ahead. What's even more indicative of that is that these two men, Oliver Granger and Jay Carter, would seek recourse against Joe for fucking them over on his Kirtland Safety Society company assets until 1843, a year before his death. I mean, they were hounding him for repayment on these assets for six years after they'd been fucked over by Joe. I mean, that's just crazy. So at the very end of July of 1837, Joe Rigdon, Hiram Smith, Thomas B. Marsh, Bloody Brigham Young, and a few others headed out on missions. Now, the overall point of these missions is somewhat unclear to me, but I'm going to assume it had something to do with the enormous debt that was crushing the church at the time. Joe, Hiram, Rigdon, and Bloody Brigham were all headed to Canada by way of ferry, which required their passing through Painesville, Ohio, home of the Painesville Telegraph, whose chief editor was Eber D. Howe, the man who wrote Mormonism Unveiled three years prior. Needless to say, Painesville wasn't so friendly to Joe and the Mormonites, and they suffered the wrath of this anti-Mormon mob. Although I would personally argue that this wrath they felt was completely justified and all traced back to Joe and his, I don't know what to call it, you know, obligation to scam anybody with whatever bullshit he can manufacture. So we're going to read from Bloody Brigham's uh, own autobiography. It spans from 1801 to 1844. There's a link to the entire thing in the show notes. It's a fascinating personal history to say the least. Quote, I started from Kirtland on a mission to the east, accompanying Prophet Joseph, his brother Hiram, David W. Patton, Sidney Rigdon, and Thomas B. Marsh on their way to Canada. When we arrived at Painesville, the Prophet was arrested by an officer for some pretended debt. Joseph immediately entered into trial before the court, which found no cause of action. After his release, he was again arrested and brought before the court. He was again dismissed. He was arrested the third time, and on examination was held over to trial. Brother Anson Call, who had lately joined the church, stepped forward and proffered to become his bail. The sheriff, who was personally acquainted with Brother Call, took him to one side and advised him strongly against being bail for the prophet, asserting that the prophet would be sure to abscond, and he would lose his farm on bail but Brother Call willingly became his bail. 
On being released, he was arrested a fourth time for a debt of a few dollars, which was paid forthwith. And the fifth time, he was arrested, which cause was soon disposed of, and he concluded to return to Kirtland for the night. As he got into his buggy, an officer also jumped in, and catching the lines with one hand, put his other hand on Joseph's shoulder and said, Mr. Smith, you are my prisoner. Joseph inquired, what was the cause of the action? The officer informed him that a gentleman, a few months previous, had left a stove with him for the price of which he was sued. Brother Joseph replied, I never wished to purchase the stove, but the gentleman insisted on putting it up in my house, saying it would bring him custom. Joseph left his watch and other property in security, and we returned home to Kirtland. <laughs> chaos, utter chaos and pandemonium going on as soon as he steps foot into Painesville. Uh, the, the next paragraph is fantastic, though. Next day, we started again and traveled by land as far as Ashtabula, shunning Painesville and other places where we suspected our enemies were laying in wait to annoy Joseph. That's what we call this annoyance. We tarried in Ashtabula through the day, wandering over the bluffs, through the woods, and on the beach of the lake, bathing ourselves in her beautiful waters until evening, when a steamboat arrived from the west. We went on board and took passage for Buffalo. I gave the prophet my valies for a pillow, and I took his boots for mine. We all laid down on the deck of the vessel for the night. End quote. So according to Bloody Brigham, as soon as Joe left Kurland and stepped foot in the township of Painesville, he was arrested at least six times making bail by the generosity of a man named Anson Call, who probably lost his farm because Joe did indeed abscond from Painesville. Then, in order to even leave Painesville on this one horrible day, Joe had to leave his watch and other property in Painesville as collateral, promising he would return to face criminal charges and various lawsuits against him. Which he never did, I might add. That's important. The day after that, the missionary troop avoided Painesville entirely so the prophet wouldn't be annoyed, quote-unquote, heading all the way to Ashtabula instead, making them finally able to go about their business and complete their mission to Canada. Now, I also want to point this out here. This was another time in Joe's history where we can see Bloody Brigham setting himself apart from other church leaders. He went with Joe to Painesville to embark upon this mission, probably to attempt absolving the Kirtland Safety Society Company of some of its debts and, you know, essentially helped Joe escape arrest and internment for crimes. Then the following day, they all made the trip again, avoiding the cops or anybody that would give them trouble or annoy them, as Brigham said. Then as a show of, you know, fraternity, brotherhood, Bloody Brigham gave Joe his luggage bag to make the prophets sleep on the boat more comfortable. And Joe gave Bloody Brigham his boots to lay his head on. This shows a level of fraternity and friendship that Bloody Brigham had with Joe that others possibly didn't. The same sense of fraternity that would earn Bloody Brigham the throne after Joe's death in Carthage. This is just one more point that we can talk about where Bloody Brigham stood out above the other people that were on the boat at the time. The various leaders returned from their mission in Canada in very late August, and then on September 3rd and 4th, 1837, that conference was held wherein Joe set apart important leaders as heretics. We we read that earlier. There were the Johnson brothers, John F. Boynton, uh, David and John Whitmer, Martin Harris, uh, Warren Parrish, Joseph Coe, and a number of others that were implicated as being in opposition to the church. In August, Joe had this to say about the Kirtland Safety Society, which at this time it was in the middle of collapsing. And this was printed in the Messenger and Advocate in the August 1837 edition. Quote, I am disposed to say a word relative to the bills of the Kirtland Safety Society Bank. I hereby warn them to beware of speculators, renegades, defectors, and gamblers who are duping the unsuspecting and the unwary by palming upon them those bills which are of no worth here. I discountenance and disprove of any and all such practices. I know them to be detrimental to the best interests of society as well to the principles of religion. End quote. <laughs> 
That's what oftentimes apologists will use as ammunition, saying that Joe didn't have any part in the Kirtland Safety Society, you know, collapsing or anything. He was just the cashier. He even saw that it was going to collapse and he warned everybody about it. And, you know, with this, this August 1837 release in the Messenger and Advocate. Frankly, those are bullshit arguments because Joe was responsible with Sidney Rigdon in devising this company to absolve the church of its debts, which just made things worse. It only exacerbated the existing problems already. Joe knew that the company was amidst collapse. There's no telling what exactly that collapse meant and what would happen once the rubble settled, but he knew it was going to happen, and I would argue that the vast majority of members of the church knew that this was coming as well. Now, I'm going to read an excerpt from John Corll's A Brief History of the Church of Christ of, uh, of Latter-day Saints. This is starting on page 46 in his own first-hand history, and I'm reading this from josephsmithpapers.org, which is a church-run online library. There will be a link to this entire history in the show notes, and I recommend reading it because you can see the actual handwritten copy, a photo, you know, a photocopy of that as well as the uh, the transcribed version on the right side of the screen. It's awesome. Uh, like I said, link in the show notes. Check it out. John Corll's History of the Church. Quote, As the house had been built by faith, as they termed it, they must now continue their faith and contrive some means to pay the debt. Notwithstanding, they were deeply in debt. They had so managed as to keep up their credit, so they concluded to try the mercantile business. Accordingly, they ran in debt in New York and elsewhere, some $30,000 for goods, and shortly after some fifty or 60000 more, as I was informed. But they did not fully understand the mercantile business, and withal they suffered pride to arise in their hearts, pride cometh before the fall, and became desirous of fine houses and fine clothes, and indulged too much in these things, supposing for a few months that they were very rich." They also spent some thousands of dollars in building a steam mill, which never profited them anything. They also bought many farms at extravagant prices and made part payments, which they afterwards lost by not being able to meet the remaining payments. They also got up a bank for which they could get no charter, so they issued their paper without a charter. And of course, they could not collect their pay on notes received for loans, and after struggling with it a while, they broke down. During their mercantile and banking operations, they only indulged in pride, but also suffered jealousy to arise among them, and several persons dissented from the church and accused the leaders of the church with bad management, selfishness, seeking for riches, honor and dominion, tyrannizing over the people, and striving constantly after power and property." On the other hand, the leaders of the church accused the dissenters with want of faith and righteousness, wicked in their intentions, guilty of crimes such as stealing, lying, encouraging the making of counterfeit money, etc. And this strife or opposition rose to a great height, so that instead of pulling together as brethren, they tried every way in their power seemingly to destroy each other. Their enemies from without rejoiced at this and assisted the dissenters what they could until Smith and Rigdon finally were obliged to leave Kirtland, and with their families came to Far West in March or April of 1838, end quote. Whew. There is a lot to parse out there, and even more to think about when we look at that small peak Coral gave us into early 1838, which we're going to get to that soon enough in the next couple episodes. The primary reason I read this was to show you just how toxic things were becoming among the members and the leadership of the church. I mean, Coral, who was a casual third-party observer, said that prominent people were accusing Joe and Rigdon of bad management, selfishness, seeking for riches, honor, and dominion, tyrannizing over the people, and striving constantly after power and property. Tyrannizing, that's an operative word. Tyranny is... Uh, we'll, we'll talk about that at the, the end of the episode. But the people that were being accused of these things were having insults like, you know, dishonest, wanting a faith and righteousness, wicked in their intentions, guilty of lying, stealing, and encouraging counterfeit money that were being slung their way by the leadership. 
I mean, the pot was calling the kettle black in this case, and I'm starting to think there wasn't a single person in the church that was happy with a single other person in the church. It seems like every single person hated their their next door neighbor. Now, granted, I'm reading a number of first person accounts that have an underlying theme of chaos and infighting, so you know, I'm probably not getting a full scope of what it was really like to be living there at the time. You know, maybe saying that everybody was fighting with everybody is a bit of an overstatement, but I'm just going on what I've read from these sources, these first-hand accounts that I've found. We're looking at a point in Mormon history where Joe and Rigdon had to deal with a level of dissent and murmuring that had never been experienced before. This was truly the climax of disunity and resistance from the lowliest member all the way to the highest echelons of leadership that had been with Joe since the beginning of the church, even before it was founded. People who had seen Joe and Ollie writing the Book of Mormon, or had contributed to getting it published, or even people who were present and baptized on the first official day of the church on April 6th, 1830, were discordant with Joe and Hinchpin Rigdon's version of the church. It was truly falling apart at the seams. I'm going to read something from Heber C. Kimball, Mormon Patriarch and Pioneer, written by Stanley B. Kimball in 1981. We know the church was in about $40,000 roughly worth of debt when the the Kirtland Safety Society Company was founded in late 1836 and early 1837. But with the paper money the company was printing, Joe and friends had gone crazy, you know, living very lavishly, buying nice clothes, buying all kinds of cool shit. And they subsequently built up an abhorrent level of confusing debt. Stanley Kimball does a good job of relaying these uh, the financial status of the church by the end of 1837. Now, this is less than one year after the Kirtland Safety Society Company was founded. I'm reading this from page 438 of The Rise of Mormonism by H. Michael Marquardt. Quote, The bank had difficulties from the beginning. The state of Ohio refused the Mormons a charter, and the bank was poorly underwritten. Heber C. Kimball, for example, subscribed to $50,000 worth of shares for only $15 in cash. In all, 200 church members subscribed to 79,420 shares, worth at face value approximately $3,854,000, at a $50 par value, which was backed up with only $20,725 cash. The bank, furthermore, was weakened by speculation, mismanagement, and dishonesty. So basically, Joe and Rigdon had tossed everybody a crap salad and then proceeded to solve the problem of shitty taste by drizzling more stupid bullshit on top of the crap salad. When somebody comes up to you and offers $50,000 for the low, low price of a whole $15, something doesn't add up in that equation. Somebody's getting fucked in this deal, and you would be smart to be skeptical of such a deal. Well, that's exactly how the majority of the Kirtland Safety Society Company's deals were handled. Now, if we divide this out, if we do just, you know, some some back-of-the-napkin math here, If we divide this out and get a sense for how bad people were actually getting taken here, we can, we can divide this out. The Kirtland Safety Society Company had $3.854 million in reported assets with less than $20,000 in actual money backing it up. That means they were trading out of an average of 185 Kirtland Safety Society notes for $1 of actual money. Now, if you divide up all 79,420 shares correctly, basing it on the company assets of $20,725 as opposed to $3.854 million that they were supposedly based on, you end up with shares that are worth $0.26 a piece that were being sold with a label of $50 a piece. Those shares are only worth 0.5% of their sold value. That means you would have to double the Kirtland Safety Society Company's assets for them to be trading at one penny on the dollar. One penny on the dollar was double what they were trading money for. That's absurd. Absurd. 
Now, when you add into this obscene level of book cooking the fact that other business practices were being conducted in a shady manner, we have some very serious symptoms manifesting themselves. In fact, PQ, Parley P. Pratt, wrote a letter to Joe at the end of May 1837 accusing the prophet of a very shady deal. Joe had sold three lots of land at the, quote, extraordinary price of $2,000, which never cost you $100, end quote. P cubed considered this to be, quote, taking advantage of your brother by an undue religious influence, end quote. That's an important phrase, by an undue religious influence. I mean, Joe was the prophet, right? Uh, uh, Let's take a second to talk about that. It's an important detail we're working with, and really, it can't be ignored. From the early days of the church, Joe was very adept at making poor monetary decisions for his parishioners, you know, mostly nefarious or self-preserving reasons. Yet these people continued to follow the prophet and not go astray. Because, why? Because he's the prophet. I mean, if we remember back to episodes 24 and 25 of this show, from almost a year ago, we'll recall that Joe had picked up everything in New York to move to Kirtland, Ohio. Well, I guess he didn't just pick up everything, because as many as 100 people may have been members at the time living in New York, so he commanded all of them to leave New York and Pennsylvania and moved to Ohio, marking the first mass exodus of Joe's church less than one year after it was founded. The revelation itself commands everybody that is worthy and faithful to sell their property and move to Ohio. And if they can't sell it, then rent it out. And if they can't rent it out, then simply abandon whatever they own. It always takes a lot of resources for anybody to move their families and their possessions nearly 300 miles, but that's made much worse by the fact that these people were doing so in covered wagons, not like in moving vans or something like we do today. Also, property back then was much harder to come by and much more valuable. In the 1830s, a person would spend their entire life savings for a gun or for a horse or a hat or a nice dress or something. At the price of $1.25, purchasing a Book of Mormon could force a family into temporary destitution. Most people lived on the land that was passed down from their parents or grandparents, who were the original European settlers on that property. However, Joe just came along and said, If you really believe in my church and consider me to be a holy, enlightened prophet, you'll leave everything behind and follow me to Ohio in the middle of the winter. This revelation forced a lot of people to leave their life savings and every piece of property they have behind them and never return just for the opportunity to live in Zion, which was still to be designated in January of 1831. People knew it was in the land westward, but didn't know where. The point I'm making is, People that believed in Joseph Smith thought he knew what he was doing, but the evidence plays out in a way that makes me think nothing could be further from the truth. Joe had to leave New York because he kept getting arrested and harassed, so he just hit the reset button and started a new life in Ohio. But the people that moved along with him, by a majority, were quite poor. This is why we see the current day Book of Covenants section 42 containing a plethora of verses about communism, where everybody that's a member of the church has to give everything they have to the bishop's storehouse, and the bishop will disseminate the wealth as he sees fit. A bunch of people were moving from New York to Ohio in the winter, and they were dirt-ass poor. So Joe came up with a revelation that called for the new members living in Ohio— to support these people that were moving there from New York. Some of these people were even Joe's friends from an earlier treasure-digging life. The point I want to make here is, you know, in every iteration of communism in human history, the purest ideal of communism hasn't really worked for any longer than a few generations. 
You can say that there have been successful economies and countries that are built on communism or some form of communism, but when we compare those countries by most metrics to their capitalistic or democratic counterparts, by most measures, communism seems fairly inadequate, and it doesn't seem to support everybody. There have been times in history that people have lived in very small communities with a tightly woven share-based economy or, you know, the perfect ideal of communism as we see it. But those communities rarely grow to be more than just a few hundred people and usually die off within a generation or two. The thing is, Joe didn't know that communism is tough to uphold when he called for Kirtland to operate as an ecclesiastical commune when people first started moving there from New York. Economics isn't as simple as the rich give to the poor and everybody's happy. There were so many other confounding factors that made Joe's decisions and revelations really burdensome and illogical when you consider the financial status of the members. There was a finite amount of resources exchanging hands in Kirtland before a bunch of Mormons came from New York with nearly zero resources. Once they arrived, it created an onerous responsibility for the newly converted Mormons that were already living in Ohio to a accommodate these religious refugees. This is a remarkable example of Joe's lack of foresight and divine connection leading to the struggles and hardships of others, specifically the people that call him the prophet of God. And I guess what I'm most confused about is why they did it. Why did people follow him? Well, I think we've kind of answered it, haven't we? I mean, he was a good salesman, a terrible businessman, but, you know, he was good at the promising side of things, not necessarily the delivery side. Joe's charisma could convince any person to do anything and make that person believe they were doing God's will while they were doing Joseph's own personal wishes. That's the extra part that makes this a little more sinister and makes me suspicious of anybody claiming to be a prophet. I mean, bad people fuck other people over on a regular basis. There's no escaping that. It could be a person claiming that there's absolutely nothing wrong with the car they're trying to sell you. It may even be someone that puts ads on television selling shitty reverse mortgages to old people that don't know that they have other options. But when you add the religious aspect to the equation of a con man, that's when things take on an extra pernicious aspect. You're not just toying with people's finances, you're fucking with their eternity and claiming to know things that no human could ever know. To answer that question, why did they follow Joe, my question would be more along the lines of, what choice did they have? When a person buys into a regular con and they find out that they've been conned, they can walk away, frustrated yet enlightened, having lost a given amount of money. When a person buys into a religious con... It's not quite as simple as walking away now, is it? And of course, personally, I would argue that all religions are cons at some level, which only goes further to illustrate my point. When a person believes in a religion, it's not as simple as just cutting their losses and walking away when that person is shown evidence that their religious leader is full of shit. Joe claimed to be a prophet and to have a connection with the divine, although history tells us that neither of those could have been true. His followers didn't have access to the information we have access to now. They couldn't take a step back from the situation and say objectively, well, obviously Joe doesn't know what the fuck he's doing. What am I wasting my time with him for? People that believe in Joseph Smith today are incapable of realizing this very simple fact. You wonder how much harder to resist he was to people that were interacting with him every single day or seeing him on the pulpit every Sunday. We have to speculate on Joseph Smith's personality here. That's not a very historian-like thing to do, but that's why I enjoy being a fan of history, not an actual historian, because I can wander into these thoughts and, you know, preface them with a disclaimer that says something you know, like, some things I say might be bullshit, but at least I can provide evidence for why I say such bullshit. Joseph Smith must have been a magnet. I'm sure that I've called him a magnet before, but he had thousands of people that would die for him and thousands of people trying to kill him at most times. He tended to have a polar effect on people, at least the people that we read these firsthand accounts from. A person either liked or hated Joseph – 
but nobody was unaffected by him. He had the power to bring communities of thousands of people together under one law and one ruler, a power which had a byproduct of thousands of people that hated Joe and Mormonism that rose up to fight against the Mormons or chase them out of town. Well, really, multiple towns at multiple times. Joe could bring a community together just as effectively as he could drive a wedge in a community that was already existing in a previously harmonious state. Even today, the debate rages about whether he was a devious mastermind or a charismatic prophet called by God. He polarizes people 170 years after his death. What can we say about a man like this? I'll tell you one thing. Um, something happened this week that I'm a bit excited about. On Facebook, astute listener Gwen added me to a Mormon historian's Facebook group. And I'll thank you very much for that, Gwen. Well, I'm in the middle of this rise of Mormonism by H. Michael Marquardt for studying up on the 1837 and 38 defection crisis. And I came upon something I was completely unaware of. Now, I read Mormon history from a lot of different sources. So there aren't just holes in my understanding of the history, but rather vast chasms that separate the few things that I do know about Mormon historical timeline. Hiding somewhere in one of these massive swaths of Mormon history that's unknown to me was something that happened in 1835 through 1836, which I found out about from the rise of Mormonism. This is quoting from page 429. It starts with quoting from Joseph Smith's journal for September 24th, 1835, two years before the, the focus of this episode has been on 1837. Quote, This day the High Council met at my house to take into consideration the redemption of Zion, and it was the voice of the Spirit of the Lord that we petitioned to the governor, that is, those who have been driven out should do so to be set back on their lands next spring, that's implying 1836, and we go next season to live or die in Jackson County. I ask in the name of Jesus that we may obtain 800 men or 1,000 well-armed, and that they may accomplish this great work. Even so, amen. What? That's crazy, right? There's another quote from John Whitmer directly underneath this in The Rise of Mormon, and it's talking about the same meeting, and he calls it the War Department. Now, the book goes on to tell us a very small amount about this thing that I completely overlooked in the history. This is from The Rise of Mormonism, quote, The redemption of Zion, set for September 11th, 1836, was still being looked forward to at this time. On March 13th, 1836, it was the resolution of the presidency and members of the Twelve to emigrate on or before the 15th of May next, if kind providence smiles upon us and opens the way before us, end quote. Did I miss something here? The redemption of Zion? I mean, I thought that they tried that once in 1834 with about 200 men, and they called it Zion's Camp. I mean, it it went horribly. Remember, like, all the cholera and all the people dying and stuff? They organized a second military march to Missouri, one that was four times the size of Zion's Camp? That's impossible. Well, I had never heard of this before, because, like I said, I study Mormon history from many sources. Surprises like this happen all the time, but this was a bigger surprise than most others. Luckily for me, Gwen had added me to this Mormon Historians Facebook group, so I thought I would just throw it in the group as a question and see what comes out. Luckily, among other people, a guy named Joe Geisner replied with some much-needed clarification. This was Joe's reply to asking about the second Zion Redemption Camp that I asked about. Quote, Ronald E. Romick and Michael S. Riggs explored the appointed time with the Saints' second attempt at redeeming Zion. After the failed mission of Zion's camp in 1834, the Mormon leaders believed that God would facilitate their return to independence and that Jackson County would be redeemed by September 11th, 1836. They derived this date from a revelation Joseph Smith received on September 11th, 1831, which instructed the saints to retain a stronghold in the land of Kirtland for the space of five years, and then move to Zion. On September 24th, 1835, Smith Journal records a meeting that drafted an article of enrollment for the redemption of Zion. The goal was to march between 800 and 1,000 well-armed soldiers to Missouri to take back independence. 
missionaries were sent through the United States to raise money and volunteers. The Mormons were instructed to gather inconspicuously in Clay County, and the first presidency was to relocate in Missouri to coordinate the plan. For various reasons, including public relation problems and lack of funding and volunteers, this plan to redeem Zion unraveled. After this second failure, Smith redefined both the meaning of Zion's location to include Nauvoo in 1840 and the Mormon role, casting them as victims instead of being responsible for their ejection from Zion in 1841-42. To support their argument, Romig and Riggs cite Joseph Smith's letter written in Nauvoo on December 15, 1840, in which he emphatically instructed Apostle Orson Hyde, that's Orson Lachaidem, to encourage any Palestinian Jews who might convert during his 1841 mission to Jerusalem to gather in Nauvoo, and ironically, not stay where they were to prepare for the return of Jesus. <laughs> I love that. So Orson Hyde, you know, we called him Lachaidem because he's, you know, in 1841, he's on a mission in Jerusalem trying to convert Jews to Mormonism. And Joe instructed them to come to Zion in Missouri. <laughs> he's like, he's telling these Jews, hey, you're, the Messiah is going to come back. You know, the, he's going to come and reign forever in Zion. And <laughs> I'm sure the Jews were like, yeah, we we know our our book has been talking about that for like, you know, 3000 years, but you know, whatever you say, sure, whatever Joseph Smith. <laughs> like, are you kidding me? He wanted them to leave Jerusalem, supposedly the the place of Zion where Zion will actually be where God and Messiah are going to come and reign so they can go to live in Zion in America. <laughs> oh, I love it. So that was this reply from Joe Geisner when I put up the question, you know, what exactly is this, the second Zion's camp that we're talking about, 800 to 1,000 men? I was so confused. I'd never heard of this before. And it was something that I'd completely overlooked in the historical timeline. I mean, he did, Joe did call for an army of 800 to 1,000 men, as well as the funding, so they can go redeem Zion again after the horrific failure in 1834 that was called Zion's Camp, Joe wanted to stir this shit pot again. Now, it's just absurd. I, but I suppose, like, a side point that I want to make with this is, you know, please don't take all of your Mormon history from me. I missed this aspect when it came up in our timeline a few episodes back, and there's no telling how many other prominent things happened that I've missed up to this point. If you just listen to this podcast for Mormon history, you're only getting my very amateur version of the history, and things will be missed. Please, I beg of you, seek out some of the books that I frequently cite to get a more comprehensive history than I'm able to provide. I mean, all the research in this episode spawned from less than 10 pages of the rise of Mormonism. It's a 650-page book. Imagine how many things I've left out up to this point. That was just a side point I wanted to make. The, the main point I'm trying to make here is it deals with these people following Joe across state lines, leaving all of their possessions behind them just to be living underneath the so-called prophet. Not only did they leave their possessions and their land behind, but in many cases, these people left their friends and their family for the grass that was supposedly always greener in Zion. Not only did these people leave behind everything and all of their loved ones, they also subjected themselves voluntarily to the rule of an unworthy dictator. The way I see it is, if you have a great leader, then let them lead. But Joe was by no metric a great leader. If you are living under an Alexander the Great or a Genghis Khan, great, let them lead. They deserve to be in that position. But Joe didn't have any attributes that made him a good leader. Worse than that, he had plenty of attributes that made him a terrible leader. He was a horrible businessman. He couldn't lead an army with any level of unity. I mean, Zion's camp nearly broke up multiple times and eventually did fracture upon their arrival to Missouri. Joe couldn't handle any amount of money, much less an entire economy based on counterfeit bills that he was responsible for. Joe constantly overpromised and underdelivered, which infuriated countless people that were left in the wake of his destruction. 
Remember when we talked about how hard it was to get a hold of Mark Hoffman in 1985 before the bombs went off? It was a recurring theme with anybody that dealt with Hoffman. You could never get him on the phone, especially when he owed you something that he had promised, like a shitload of money or some old document or something. This is another extract from the Rise of Mormonism that leads me to believe that Joe may have been the same way in some respects. In 1837, a man named William S. West visited Kirtland and reported what he saw during this this time of epic turmoil that was happening. This was originally published in a pamphlet called A Few Interesting Facts Respecting Mormonism, and I'm reading it from page 438 of The Rise of Mormonism by Mark Ward. Quote, When I was in Kirtland, I ascertained from a variety of sources, too numerous to mention, that the Mormons had been in serious difficulty. Many had been dissatisfied with their leaders and wanted a new prophet, but the majority adhered to Smith. One day when I went to the temple, I saw a number of men about it. Busy in conversation, Smith was among them, and the topics of discussion were the bank, money, the steam sawmill, etc. The prophet was kept very busy, but at last he started towards the banks. When a man said to him, Brother Joseph, I want to speak with you a minute. Upon which he exclaimed, My God, I wish I was translated. He did not stop to speak with him, but went on grumbling that everyone wanted to speak with him a minute, etc. End quote. The more that I study Joe the more I see parallels between him and other con men in history. Hoffman went through a similar trajectory as Joe did, and some of their mannerisms seem to be exactly the same. Terrible businessmen, terrible with money, constantly over-promising and under-delivering, constantly avoiding people that want to speak with them for a minute, probably so they didn't have to listen to the person complaining about getting fucked over by him. Let's talk about that quote earlier from the Rise of Mormonism. It said, The redemption of Zion, set for September 11th, 1836, was still being looked forward to at this time. On March 13th, 1836, it was the resolution of the presidency and the members of the Twelve to emigrate on or before the 15th of May next, if kind providence smiles upon us and opens the way before us. The redemption of Zion was set for September 11th, 1836. You may think as I did, that's quite an arbitrary date. What happened? Who set that date apart as a special day of reckoning? For the answer to that question, we can thank Joe Geisner. We need to look back into a revelation that was given on September 11th, 1831, exactly five years before this arbitrary redemption date. This is the current day Book of Covenants, section 64, quote, I willeth not that my servant Frederick G. Williams should sell his farm, for I the Lord willeth to retain a stronghold in the land of Kirtland for the space of five years, in the which I will not overthrow the wicked that thereby I may save some. End quote. This is the revelation that people were using as a prophecy for the redemption of Zion. They figured that Kirtland had been the stronghold for the entire five years, so now it was time for the members to march to Zion and take it by whatever means necessary so that can be their stronghold. Just to reiterate this point, the Missourians hated the Mormons. The Mormons were an apocalyptic Jesus death cult that followed the whims of a convicted felon. Merely two verses— after that verse that we just read from section 64, it says this, quote, For after today cometh the burning. This is speaking after the manner of the Lord. For verily I say, tomorrow all the proud, and they that do wickedly shall be as stubble, and I will burn them up. For I am the Lord of hosts, and I will not spare any that remain in Babylon. End quote. What would you think? If you were somebody living in Missouri, minding your own business, and then a bunch of members of this death cult move in and tout scriptures that talk about burning up those who are in opposition to the church. That's a little threatening, right? It, this date was set apart, September 11th, 1836, and Joe was supposed to make one of his own prophecies come to fruition. He had proclaimed a prophecy that the members of the church were waiting to see if it would come true. Well, for whatever reasons, Joe didn't end up forming the, you know, 1,000 man army and making the 800 plus mile journey to Missouri again like he had in 1834, which 
It's probably a good thing because it would have inevitably ended in disaster. Instead, instead of fulfilling a prophecy, Joe was in Salem, Massachusetts during this time, digging for buried treasure. At a time in Mormon history when members expected Joe to be fulfilling a prophecy, he was in another part of the country, hundreds of miles away, trying to find buried treasure. Being swindled by Burgess, just like Joe had swindled so many others before. Joe had the opportunity to make his own violent prophecy come true. Instead, he chose to run away and ignore the problem. That's a bit of a recurring theme we need to keep in mind. Joe didn't have a problem if he could simply run away from it. When the twins were born and died hours later, he ran to Missouri to the embrace of a friend 800 miles away from the problem. When Joe was supposed to lead an armed militia of 1,000 people to Missouri to forcibly take back the homes of the Mormons that had been chased out, he went hundreds of miles in the other direction to hunt for buried treasure in Massachusetts. As we'll find out very soon, When there was a problem with a printing press exposing Mormonism in Joe's shady business deals, Joe was happy to set that printing press ablaze and run away from the problem. Might be saying, well, yeah, that doesn't happen until 1844 in Nauvoo, you know, seven years and hundreds of miles from what we're talking about right now. And I'd say you're correct. But I will also say that the Nauvoo Expositor wasn't the only printing press that Joe commanded to be destroyed in his time. Destroying a place of journalism in order to cover something up is an act of tyranny. And let's just say, when that quote we read earlier from January of 1838 said that Joe was tyrannizing people, there's plenty of evidence available to make that a completely true claim. So, to continue this conversation about Joe and his personality... I recently received a message on Facebook from Hayden, and I I did my best to answer it, and it seems applicable to what we're talking about right now, so I'm just going to read his question and then my response. They're, They're not too long. Hayden sent in, I know you can't say this for sure, but do you think Joseph was a pathological liar and maybe even believed his own lies, or do you think he just got way too in over his head with a lie to get rich and maybe a little famous and just had to keep it going and had no idea how big the church would be today? Or do you have another idea? Uh, But this is my reply here. Hayden, I'm at such a loss to answer that question. Personally, given what I know about Joe, I totally think he was consciously lying the whole time. He never actually saw buried treasure. He didn't actually hear a voice in his head that would conveniently solve his problems. You know, any more so than a person has a conscience that does exactly the same thing. He didn't just marry those women only because he thought God wanted it. He was self-serving and pathologically lying till the end. But to add to that, you said, do you think he got way too in over his head with a lie? What makes you think he didn't want everything that happened to him? He didn't become famous because he fucked up and things got ahead of hand. He got famous because he wanted and worked for it. He lived like a god. He never had to work for anything. He lived on other people's goodwill, quite lavishly, I might add. And he fucked any woman he wanted to. What makes you think he didn't dream about having that life from a young age? I bet he was willing to do anything necessary to make that lifestyle happen, which he did. And once he attained his dream, he couldn't just stop furthering those aspirations. He always had his foot on the gas. I wish I were more qualified to answer your question, but this is the way I've come to interpret the historical Joseph Smith. Hopefully this version of Joe becomes clearer as you progress through the backlog. Thanks for the message, Hayden. That seems to be the Joe that I'm seeing as I progress through my own research. Joe was happy to make or take a deal that involved no risk and high reward, even if that deal seemed too good to be true. It was only when Joe was in a high-risk, low-reward situation that we see him bailing out all the time. When it came to marching a second army to Missouri, it was highly likely that Joe would be killed or arrested, and there was no guarantee that they would be successful by any measure of the word. When this situation of Joe's commitment to raise a second larger army presented itself, Joe bailed. He ran. He left town for a short amount of time, all the while other church leaders were plotting to kill him. 
One thing we can take away from this time in history, Joe was not in control. There are only a few more prominent occurrences in 1837 that we have to cover before we finish it and move into 1838. And by the end of 1838, we have the actual Missouri-Mormon War and the Battle of Crooked River, which was not so much a war as just a few armed scuffles between Mormons and the opposing mob, but it's called a war for whatever reason. We'll be getting to that within the next few historical timeline episodes. It's just important to keep in mind throughout this entire time that Joe was not in charge. Rather, he was playing everything by ear, pulling everything everything out of his ass, and still frequently painting himself into corners. In studying the timeline chronologically as I've done, I can't imagine how things could get any worse from this point on. But they did somehow. I mean, I'm excited that the Liberty Jail scene and the Nauvoo years are twinkling in the eyes of the podcast to be exposed and examined in the very near foreseeable distance, but I must remind you, Take that side point I made seriously. I'm not going to be able to tell the whole story in our narrative, nor will I be able to give every prominent person a name or nickname without getting confused. I'll occasionally breeze right past very important things in the timeline and have to come back and cover them later, like we did in this episode with the War Department, as John Whitmer called it. Don't take all your Mormon history from me, unless you're satisfied with a simplistic perspective and having a very cursory understanding of the biggest points in the narrative. I suppose, you know, for the average listener, that's enough. Dealing with my simplicity and the type of light that I shed on Joe and Reagan and everybody else will be enough to get the average Mormon history buff along in the world, but to have a deep and nuanced discussion about specifics of Mormon history... This show is not enough for an avid student of Mormon history. Indulge yourself, read a book on Mormonism, then come back and share what you've learned with me so I can act like I know about it and give my bullshit perspective of what you just learned. Just like with that question from Hayden, I'm not qualified to speculate on the personality of Joseph Smith or anything else, really, but I sure like to think about it like I understand who the real Joe was, regardless of how accurate or not my perspective is. I know the Joe that surfaced from my own research to create this show, but the reality is there was so much about Joe that we could never understand. The real Joseph Smith has to hide in the recesses of historical blind spots. Only his most prominent features come out when we read about him today, but the man behind the narratives that have been written about Joseph Smith was undoubtedly, incomprehensibly, more nuanced and amazing than any single narrative could portray. Now, hopefully, as the listener, you have your own Joe that lives and breathes in your mind that differs from the Joe that the church or I will portray. Hopefully, your personal Joe is who you see dealing with these problems and coming up with various shenanigans to make money and solve said problems. I guess... I'm hoping it isn't just the Joe that I've constructed that fills that void in your mind. One thing I can assure you, no words could properly describe the Joe Smith and Sidney Rigdon that live in my mind. I try every episode to describe these people, but they're living, breathing people in my mind that wander through an abyss of historical uncertainty and deal with each new thing in our timeline as it progresses, approaching these circumstances with no foresight or plan whatsoever. And that's probably the most liberating thing about studying these people. They are real people existing in living color inside our imaginations. They can overcome any historical trial they encounter. They can climb every mountain and traverse every valley. They can construct armies and raise cities to the ground. They can twist insurrection into religious persecution and have stronger membership because of it. The Joe in my mind is an invincible protagonist of a forgotten age. I can only hope that your personal Joe inspires just as much awe and wonder as mine.
And that is it for the historical portion of the episode. Uh, next week is going to be the airing of the Clean Cut Mark Hoffman Part 3 episode. If you want to listen to that episode before next week, you can always go on to patreon.com slash nakedmormonism and find the episode for free download there. Uh, if you don't mind waiting for another week for it, you'll see it in the regular feed next week, uh, next Thursday evening, as usual. Uh, as for that, the following week after that, the following episode after that will uh, hopefully be something special or something, uh, but that's still in the works. We'll, we'll have to see how things develop from here. But that's it for this episode. So before closing the lid tonight, got to thank a few people. Start off by thanking Demonista for keeping up on the Facebook page. She does a great job there. Thank you so much for that. I also want to thank Jason Camo for providing the music in this show that is used with his permission. For more of his music, go to alloststateofmind.com. I want to thank Craig Keeling for providing the artwork for this show that you see, as well as a daughter podcast. For his blog, go to weirdmormonshit.com. I want to thank all of the listeners who support the show through patreon.com slash naked mormonism thank you so much i also want to thank everybody who rates the show on itunes or stitcher or your podcasting app of choice helps people find it that are looking for mormon history podcasts if you want to leave a voicemail for the show be sure to dial 864-625-3366 or 864-NAKED-MO leave your voicemail there talking about the show your story previous episodes corrections anything you'd like but most of all and last and definitely not least, in fact, last and most, we'll say it, I want to thank all of you amazing listeners for lending me your ear. I hope to talk to you next time here on the Naked Mormonism Podcast.
oddly enough, in, in that paper break between 1837 and 1839, Wilford Woodruff listed a bunch of his wives and their marriage dates. It's like, hey, look at all that acid I was tapping. Yeah, yeah. high five. Yeah, anyone? High five? Anyone? That's cool. I'll, I'll just high five myself. 